Welcome back to another video. I thought I'd have a look at the Dynax 5 or Maxim 5 in America. This is one of the more affordable film bodies of the later generation Minolta autofocus system. So what I'll do is go over some of the controls on the camera. As you can see here, we do have sensors by the eyepiece for the iStar autofocus. There's your power switch on the right hand side, autofocus, and there's also a spot button which doubles as the slow sync for flash. There's your button for opening the back of the body and you've also got a recessed rewind button. When the film's in this camera that will actually automatically lock and turn red. There is a way to override that and open it manually although I won't get into that on this video. The camera is mostly made out of plastic although I think the plastics are perfectly fine. Doesn't seem to be any obvious creaking or bending or flexing. For this model you need two CR2 lithium batteries to power it. There is an option later on to use a battery pack and I will show you that. I do actually have that. Onto the side controls there's your lens release, autofocus, manual focus switch and on the left side your exposure compensation and your flash button. The flash on this camera is quite advanced. You do have wireless control as well which is very unusual. And it also supports high speed sync if you're using an external flash unit. On the grip, you can see those metal strips, and they are for the iStar autofocus. There's your depth of field preview button. Here's the remote control port. I have put the model numbers for the supported ones on screen. You can get third party ones as well, pretty inexpensively. I'll just mount a lens now. You can see the lens mount is metal, or at least most of it is metal. The um, inner lugs are actually a sort of hard plastic. This camera supports focus with both in-lens motors and screw-driven lenses. That's one of the advantages of the later models. It's a comfortable enough camera to hold, but I did have mixed feelings with the hand grip. It's more of a wedge shape and not as rounded as some of the cameras that I've used. And likewise with the control dial, it's pointing straight up, it's fine. It just takes a little bit of getting used to with the position compared to some other cameras. Push the eye cup up and then you'll be able to attach the cover. Useful to have if you need to do longer exposures and prevent light from getting in. Give you a quick shot inside the viewfinder now so you can have a look at the autofocus system. Seven point autofocus and the points do light up. You can change these settings in the custom functions. So you're just pushing and holding the autofocus button. Use the control dial and that will switch between your wide area or your specific points that you want. Or you can set it so that it will go to the central focus point. 90% coverage is fairly typical of the cameras you got at this price point. You generally only got the 9500% with the much more expensive Pentaprism ones. What I wanted to do now is just to cover some of the operation and this is the function dial on the left hand side. Data panel on this is quite clear though it isn't backlit. Not surprising considering the price point. As far as the operation goes I'll put all the information on screen for you. First setting I've got is the program aperture and shutter with the manual mode. All of the settings are on this it's simply a case of turning the function dial to the desired setting combination of using the control dial on the right or pressing the function button to cycle between different options. Exposure bracketing as well as multiple exposures and you can take more than two exposures. Here's your audio signals, that's with your beep with the autofocus confirmation. The iStart autofocus, there's a couple of options with that. You can have either the sensor and the grip, so the IP sensor or just the sensor on its own. Custom functions are unfortunately just numbered and there's 14 in total and multiple options depending on what the setting is. I'll just put that on screen for you so that you can have a look at that if you need to. Quite a few settings there that you might want to tweak. The user manual will explain that in a bit more detail. As you'd expect this does have DX coding for film although you can manually set the ISO from 6 to 6400. With the autofocus modes you have a choice of automatic, continuous or single shot. The automatic will detect if there's any movement and engage the continuous if it sees movement when you're focusing. 
Here's your control for the red eye reduction on the flash and the wireless flash control. I move in closer onto the right hand side to show you the controls there. The P button or the panic button as many people call it is a program reset button. Here's your drive button. If you press that you can go through single, continuous or the self timer and if the model supports it the remote control. You'll see the head icon there that's for your scene modes and you have a total of five of those. Perhaps the sport mode is the most useful because that gives you the continuous autofocus, a quick way of getting to that. If you're wondering about the manual mode, how you control both the aperture and shutter speed, the control dial will normally control the shutter, but you'll have to hold the exposure compensation button in, and then that will control the aperture. I start autofocus can be quite useful. I have it set here so that you need both the grip sensor and the IP sensor to activate the autofocus. There's your drive mode, three frames per second. That's not too bad. I remember the first film camera I got and that was only around about 1.5 frames a second. And next up, I'm gonna show you the BP200 battery pack. It's not particularly common, at least I haven't seen many of them out there recently. It is quite useful for two reasons, apart from the fact that you can power the camera via four AA batteries. What it also does is extend the grip length and I found that it makes it a little bit more comfortable holding it in the hand. I'm not sure how much these cost originally when they were released, but um, I picked this up for a pretty reasonable price quite a few years ago now, um, but it is quite a handy thing to have, and it does work on the Dynax 4 and on the 3L, as well as the 5, so there's three models that it will work with. There is one obvious area to look for with this camera, and that is the blued mirror, as they call it. It's a discolored penta mirror, and some of the cameras will have it, some will have it strongly, and some will have very mild. If it's very mild, it's not too bad, but if it's a strong tint, it makes the viewfinder much darker. Also pay attention to the metering system. The honeycomb metering is actually quite good. It is linked to the autofocus point, which is generally a good idea. There's no center weighted with this particular model, but it's useful that you do have the spot metering. Overall, you're not gonna be unhappy with the exposure, and I've always found the focus to be quite fast and generally very accurate. In low light, you might need to raise the flash to get a better focus lock. It's a much quicker focus system than some of the earlier Minolta cameras in the 80s or the early 90s. They definitely improved it quite a bit, Plus you can use those lenses that have built-in motors as well as the screw drive lenses. It is surprisingly well featured for a camera in this price range. It has most of what you want. A couple of quirks aside, if you can get a good one of these, it's definitely a bargain and a capable enough performer. You also have a large selection of autofocus Minolta lenses out there, which you can pick up for a very modest price outlay. Don't forget to drop a comment below if you've got any questions on this. I'm happy to answer them and thanks for watching.